Mark McLaughlin, thank you so much for your time. I'm really looking forward to to chatting with you. Um, for the listeners at home, just to give them a little bit of context, you presented at a seminar a few years ago back when I was an intern at University of Portland. So it's it's awesome to see how this has kind of come full circle. Um, but for the listeners at home, will you tell us a little bit about your background, your motivation, and kind of where you are currently? Sure, sure. So, um, so my background is I was um, fortunate enough to uh, play sports through uh, college. Mm-hmm. Uh, I played both basketball and baseball uh, in college um, and just had a lifelong passion for sports, even though I was had to get a real job in yeah. sales <laughs> and um, but always wanted to um, to somehow get back into in, in the sports and I actually got into the coaching realm later in life than um, so I didn't start really coaching until I was like late 30s mm. early 40s okay and um, when you say coaching reason, do you mean sport coaching or actual like strength coaching strength coaching okay yeah yep and the the main reason I got into it was when I would read the paper uh-huh. uh, in the morning during track and field season, there seemed to be a lot of catastrophic injuries mm. that in a non-contact sport should not be happening. Yep. So there was a gal who ran cross country down in Bend who broke her femur. Mm. Um, there were three girls from, from one high school that had anemia. Wow, okay. And um, there was a really good 400-meter runner at uh, Benson High School mm-hmm who only ran in one state championship because he had really bad hamstring injuries his in, entire high school career. Mm. So then at that point, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go visit these schools and see yeah. what's going on on the training. Mm-hmm. And after watching that happen, I'm like, okay, there's got to be a better way to allow these, these athletes to, um, perform at their full potential yeah and and so that's what you know got me researching it and you know i'm not uh college educated um on training Mm -hmm. i'm Mm self-taught um and so i just had a a thirst for knowledge Mm. okay well you're kind of in in some good company right because some of the smartest people i feel like are are self-taught and if we're thinking about you know joel jameson and, and guys like that you know that's that's some great company to be in. Sure, absolutely. Um, so what kind of is your passion in life, right? So why did you even get into coaching and, and why do you want to do what you do? I know you kind of touched on it briefly, right? But just expand on that thought a little bit more. Yeah, so um, when I was growing up, I mean, we just were not injured. Mm. Um, and I don't know if it's because we weren't really aware of it, but... Yeah. You know, I mean, we had, you know, sprained ankles and things like that. But, you know, all the guys that I grew up with in high school and played with in college, there weren't injuries. Mm. Um, And even as I got older and everything, there was still not, you know, injuries. Um, And then I looked at, you know, the the athletes, like I mentioned in the newspaper, and Mm. then going out and watching, um, you know, these kids train. Mm. And it just... It just did not make sense to me. Mm. And so I started, yeah. and so then I started researching um, on how to train myself. Okay. So I was, I was my first um, athlete to kind of, um, kind of go at it. And I had just come off a of knee surgery. Yeah. And so, you know, I wanted to see if I could ride a 200 mile uh, bike race from Seattle to Portland. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, with, uh, with eight months of training. Yeah. And I did it and I finished in like 10 hours and, and some change. And so that was like the first success story. Mm-hmm. And then I began volunteering at the high school that I went to mm-hmm. um, with the football program. Okay. And so I was a strength coach there on a volunteer basis for three years. Okay. And that is where I really was able to then begin to figure out, 
you know, what certain athletes need at, at different ages, uh-huh. you know, how to make the progression, um, you know, lifting heavy weights all the time is not necessarily the end all be all. Yeah. Cause then there's the sport performance side of things that we need to take into account. Yeah. Um, and you want the training process to be fun for the athlete. Yeah, so how do you, definitely. so, so how do you do that uh-huh. in a way where they continue to improve? Mm, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. um, so that's, you know, that was kind of my, my motivation early on. Mm, okay. And then you, you kind of mentioned that you, you took a job in sales, right? Do you believe that any of the skill sets from that job have transferred over to your coaching? Absolutely. I mean, because we are salesmen in a way, yeah. like we need to have buy-in. Okay. And the way that you buy into the program uh-huh. is going to be different than another person. Yeah. So you have to be a very good listener. Uh-huh. You have to understand body language. You have to understand the internal motivations of the athlete. Mm, okay. And, you know, internal motivations for a 13 or 14-year-old are far different than, you know, a 22, 23-year-old yeah. who's making, you know, 3 to $5 million a year yeah. or has a full-ride scholarship. Yeah. And so you really kind of run the full gamut of motivation. And, and my coaching style was very... Um, it was very calm. Mm-hmm. Like I'm like, I, I'm not a yeller or anything. Only okay. if, you know, safety concerns are, yeah. are there. Uh-huh. Um, cause I wanted the athlete to really, you know, buy into a, what we were doing, but B be extremely self motivated. Yeah. And it's like, Hey man, I mean, some days you're not going to have it. That's yeah. just the way it is. Uh-huh. So then teaching them that that's okay. Uh huh to be honest, you know, with the process and understand that, you know, Rome was not built in a day mm. and this stuff takes time. Yeah. Okay. And it, and it takes a lot of work. And yeah. so there was a lot of lessons from sales, just from, you know, understanding that, you know, people are people and yeah. everyone kind of responds differently. Mm. I like that. Okay. Will you kind of touch on your current business model and, and some of the consulting work that you do? Yeah, so so right now I'm I, I took a job with Omega Wave like okay. two and a half years ago. Oh, okay. And um, so I handle um, sales for sales and education for North America. Yeah. Um, and then I I still uh, train a few athletes um, remotely. Okay. And and um, a lot of those athletes are. Uh, special forces uh-huh. or uh, government uh, operators. Gotcha. And then I have one basketball player who I started training when he was 13. Mm-hmm. And now he's just graduated from college and he's looking to turn professional. So mm. I still work with him. Okay. So let's let's dive into that training, right, a little bit. So what does your approach to training kind of look like for, for different age groups? Sure. So... <laughs> You know, I was fortunate that with when I had the training business, mm-hmm. I was able to get kids that were relatively young, you yeah. know, like 12 or 13. Yeah. And there's a lot of talk on the Internet now with, you know, long-term athletic development programs yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff, which is important. But a lot of it is theory. Mm. And there's very few guys that actually practice it. Um, there is a gentleman uh, on the East Coast, Jeremy Frisch, um, who does like an amazing job. Yeah, and puts out a lot of good so, content. Yeah, yeah, and he like he is like he's living it. Yeah, and so so with myself, man, we really focused on natural movements like we did a lot of gymnastics okay um i had a couple in i had one intern who was a high school or excuse me a college cheerleader Uh and and so his tumbling and acrobatic skills were off the charts yeah and so you know we had a a couple years with chris Mm -hmm. where 
man, we, we had some football players that were doing some amazing aerial. Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> That's awesome. you know, so, you know, focusing on movement, uh-huh. focusing on strength in a natural setting. So, you know, sprinting, you know, push ups, pull ups, you know, med ball work, yeah. uh, jumping, and just really exposing them to a lot of different things. Mm, okay. And when I felt that the time was right to then begin to integrate, um, actual resistance training yeah then you know that was typically like you know for some kids it wasn't until they were like 16 years old Mm -hmm. but they had such a solid strength base from all the movement stuff that we had been doing yeah that their learning curve was quite fast Mm, yeah um and then once they kind of moved into adding resistance to the training Mm -hmm. For, for those kids that were 15, 16 years old, it was a very concurrent program. Yeah. Um, you know, sprints, you know, two days a week, two to three days a week, mm-hmm. you know, jumping, you know, med ball work, mm-hmm. um, basic strength training. Um, and then, you know, after one to two years of that, then we began to you know, really kind of hone in on the physiological parameters that were needed. Mm, Okay. And this kind of goes back to actually the start where if I have a 12 or 13 year old, like, and we'll take football, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody wants, you know, fast 40 vertical jump, standing long jump. So all the combine events. Yeah. 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 So we would, you know, we would start testing them and that stuff at the beginning. Okay. And then we also began to test them on the Omega Wave, Mm -hmm. which for the, you know, listeners of your podcast that don't know, Omega Wave is a non-invasive test, Mm -hmm. which determines the readiness of the autonomic nervous system, the central nervous system for training. Okay. Yeah. And we had set up... um, because we did work with professional football players, mm-hmm. we set up what we thought were um, the ideal physiological norms. So not only did we have the physical stuff, so the 40 and all that, yeah. but okay, to be a pro football player, here's the resting heart rate we need to get you at. Mm-hmm. Here's the autonomic balance we need you at. Here is where we need your central nervous system at. Mm-hmm. And so when they were 12 or 13, then we had that baseline test. And so the goal of the training throughout their lifespan with us was to move them closer to those professional levels. Mm, Okay. Didn't mean obviously that they were going to be in the NFL, but, but we had targets that we wanted to meet. Yeah. And so all the training is geared around hitting those physiological markers and then also the physical markers. Yeah. Okay. So if that makes sense. So with that, right? Does how does a assessment kind of change since you have access to you know something like Omega Wave? Do, is that pretty much take over exclusively, or do you do field tests a lot, or or how do um, how does one ebb and flow? You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a great question. So, and it kind of goes back to the question you asked earlier about uh-huh. you know how I how I looked at, you know, athletes motivation. Yeah. Everybody has their motivator. Yeah. You know, some guys want to be super strong. Uh Some guys want to be fast, you know, all that stuff. And so if you test it and show them where they're at, Uh they're going to be motivated to come back and train. Yeah. And, And this gets, and this gets back to the, the internal motivator. So we were assessing, say, strength and speed and power, some of it, you know, weekly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the physiological testing was, as the kids got older, it was actually almost every day. Yeah. Um, but it was constant. Okay. And so that way it's like, okay, we just got done with four weeks. Okay, we're going to retest. 
okay, here, here's where you are now. Yeah. Here's where you were last time. Okay, we have a new set. Okay, now the new training is going to come in. So it was just this ongoing mm-hmm. assessment, retest, train, mm-hmm. test, rest. I mean, it was – it always – gave them something to want to come in to train for. Mm, okay, so so your assessment looked less like um, there was not necessarily like FMS or like movement screens or say like specific lift tests or things like that. It was more of like you're looking at these certain markers and how they're responding to training. Is that Am I correct in that? Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And so, you know, the training is all based on, okay, how much stress can the athlete handle? Okay. And when you look at their sport Mm -hmm. and when you look at the game and the training that they undertake, Uh and I'm talking sport training here, our goal was to get them to have such a strong resistance to, to stress Mm -hmm. that, that the fatigue that they could go and practice or play hard, without mm-hmm. fatigue setting in too early. Mm. So it was always to give them the, I mean, the biological power to display their skill at the highest level with okay. the least amount of fatigue. Mm. So that's why the autonomic system, you know, parasympathetic and sympathetic was so important for recovery because yeah. if you're more parasympathetic, recovery is going to be better. Yeah. And then as they got older, we would implement very hard and intense hormonal sessions to increase the size of the endocrine glands. Okay. So then when they, so then when they were put under this immense amount of stress, yeah, their internal organs could handle it. Mm. And then their central nervous system. Okay. Is it, is it at the right, um, setting so yeah. where they can, display their skill and uh-huh. then also practice and get a lot out of their practice. Okay. That makes sense. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's dive into those um, specific like sessions that you were talking about. Right. So what does a typical strength training session kind of look like for, um, I mean, what's a, like just a general strength training session. So, and I'll, and I'll take the guys that would like go through the basic stuff and kind of get to the end. So, mm-hmm. The model that I was taught yeah. um, was Monday is the hardest day okay. of, of training. So we called it the developmental day. Okay. And so if we were doing like hormonal training, you know, we would do 80 to 90 percent of their max um, squat, for example. Okay. And they might do seven to ten sets to failure Mm. so they would do one set to failure rest two to three minutes do another set to failure rest two to three minutes um hey i mean it was extreme yeah um and there were certain physiological parameters and also length of time that they were with us Uh to where they had to earn the right to participate in that work. Okay. So we just weren't giving it to them for the sake of giving it to them. Yeah. Because if they're not robust enough, yeah, it will the the training effect will be lost. Okay. Um. So we would do that type of work. Uh-huh. Uh, we would also do, um, you know, maybe prior to that session, we would do you know sprinting. Mm-hmm. And we kept volume anywhere from like 100 to 200 meters total. Okay. Um, right in that speed do, zone. Excuse me? Right right in that speed zone, yeah? Yep. Okay. Yep. And it was all electronic time. Okay. So if, if they fell uh, outside of 95%, 93% of their best times, uh-huh. we would shut the that down. Okay. Um, so it was, you know, it was... Um, monitored uh quite strictly okay um and then we may do some jumps after that it just kind of would depend on you know where the athlete was in the training cycle yeah then they would go into the lifting Mm -hmm. um and then they would do i mean if they did that hard hormonal session Mm -hmm. like 
after that they may be done yeah yeah um now if it was a little bit different lifting session then we may put um some like oxidative work at the end okay of the session yeah um using like 30 to 40 percent of their max uh-huh. doing like a like a two down and a two up but under constant tension okay and that was to build the uh, the oxidative capacity of the slow twitch fiber mm. And even for power speed athletes, like that stuff is very important because yeah. it allows them to um, be more aerobic yeah. throughout early sets of the game. Uh-huh. So if these guys are going anaerobic too early, fatigue sets in, and then at the end of the game when it counts, they're they're not worth anything. Mm, yeah. So we really focused on a lot of. Um, particular work for the fibers um, and then we would do specific work for sprinting uphill or with a sled for the fast twitch fibers okay um, and that would be later on yeah uh, in the week okay no that's very interesting and then so how does you you touched on it um briefly but how does the uh the typical energy system development look like to complement some of that work yeah so kind of talking about the oxidative work on a, on a lifting session. Uh-huh. Um, you know, actually early on and say like the general preparation for these athletes, yeah, we would do like strength aerobic work where we would have them on heart rate monitors and they would do like specific lifting mm. to where their heart rate would be between like 120 and 140 mm. for cardiac development. Okay. And so the way that we looked at the cardiac system was you need a balance. So you need the size of the left ventricle, which can only be developed through heart rates of, say, 100 to 120. Okay. Which is typically for, like, endurance athletes. Yeah. So so very slow heart rates to expand the size. Uh Uh-huh. And then you need the other side of it, which is the strength side. Yeah. Which which was done with heart rates say between like 120 and 140. Okay. And so for our power speed athletes in the general prep cycle, we would do strength work uh-huh. that would also complement the cardiac side. So it was very specific to, you know, heart rates between 120 and 140. Yeah. They could be they could be doing barbell lifts. They could be doing body weight circuits. Um, so early on, that's how we would do um, strength work for the cardiac side. Mm-hmm. Um, we would also give them, um, and I'm just talking now about the cardiac system. So we would give them, say, like maybe a half an hour or 45 minutes prior to some sessions early on. Okay. With on on the elliptical. Yeah. Or treadmill, you know, 120 to 140. Okay we would do long walks and stuff mm-hmm. to, again to develop the cardiac system yeah because also not only do you get the left ventricle both size and strength uh-huh. but then also that work has very good effect on the development of the parasympathetic nervous system mm. and with these athletes with the parasympathetic mild dominance yeah. it allows them to recover quicker. Yeah. So that was the other um, reason we would do that work. Okay. Um, so with some of that oxidative training, right, what kind of rebuttal would you say? There's a lot of college coaches who, um, I mean, while you are hitting specific physiological demands for adaptation, right, there's a lot of co- college coaches who might think that that type of work isn't as uh, sexy, for lack of a better word. What, what kind sure. of rebuttal would you have for that? Well, I mean, do you, do you want your athletes to be dominant on Saturday and be able to handle practices, or you know, do you want to you know have sexy work that doesn't work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and fair enough. The other thing, and I, I thought about this a lot. Mm-hmm was a lot of the sport coaches mm-hmm. don't don't know what they're doing <laughs> on in in practice yeah and so one of the other reasons we did a lot of this work was because we needed 
our guys to be able to handle stupidity mm. <laughs> and um you know sometimes you just cannot prepare them enough for what they're going to um endure yeah to the point where you see it like at university of oregon or some of these other places where they're training guys in the rapdo yeah and so you know it's um you know the um the glamour on this was um, it was in what we were trying to develop, which then went in turn to the um, oh, how do I put it the um, um, the culture mm-hmm. that we developed within our system yeah was just about doing the work and making sure that they understood why we were doing it. Mm. Okay. So the buy-in was, I mean, you know, I mean, we had guys doing some of this work and the byproduct of it was they were stronger than ever, faster, yeah. could jump higher. Uh-huh. I mean, in the end it all worked out. Okay. So even for example, say kids that went off and played college, right? And had a college strength coach that may have had conflicting um, ideologies was the mm-hmm. the buy-in was still fairly fairly much there because they would see the result? Yeah, so once guys shipped off to college, uh-huh. especially the D1 programs, yeah, especially for football, after that it was like they would come back during the summer, but a lot of them had to stay at school, which, mm. you know. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, it was – I just wouldn't train them anymore. Okay, yeah. Um, But then we had other kids come from D1 programs during, like, spring break or whatever. Yeah. And they were terribly out of shape. Mm. Um, And I tell the one story. um, A kid came up from the University of Oregon. He was a football player, scholarship, Uh second string. And he wanted to train with us for a week. Mm -hmm. And so we put him through a basic um, body weight circuit. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, after the second round, uh, he failed uh, doing ten push-ups. Oh wow! And he quit and never came back. <laughs> uh, okay. So, you know, that's the other thing. It's like there's a lot of good programs that win football games. Yeah. That have these storied strength programs that are they're not good. Yeah. And. So that's why I was fortunate when I was younger mm-hmm. to really understand who I should listen to mm-hmm. and cut through all the fat mm. to say, okay, we know this guy is a fraud. Yeah. This guy isn't. Okay, man, we're going to listen to him. Mm. And so that would guide me on what to read, how to train, how to make these changes to yeah. where other guys is just like, okay, they're just there for the show. They have a you know, a, a cow horn mustache or whatever, <laughs> and they're on YouTube. It's like, no, that's not us. Interesting. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. You know, there there are a lot of people out there who, who uh, you know, don't necessarily know what they're doing. So yeah. um, I think that's that's really important. Okay. And then as far so as – one, one, Oh, go ahead. One other point I want to make about the people that don't know what they're doing, especially uh-huh. when it comes to physical training, uh-huh. and I always – prided myself in this is that we as trainers are taking these kids health Mm -hmm. in in, into our hands they're entrusting us with it Mm -hmm. and so we need to be very cognizant as coaches not to do any harm Mm, yeah i'm not saying i'm not saying that we don't train hard Mm -hmm. what i'm saying is that there's a limit to what these kids can undertake Mm -hmm. And as a special forces Delta Force guy told me one time, mm-hmm. anybody can be broken. Mm, yeah. And with our profession, there can be death. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we need to understand that, um, yeah, we can do a lot of harm or a lot of good. Mm, yeah. No, I think that's a that's a, a heavy thing to, to think about, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's it's really important to think about though. So Yeah. Moving forward with that, right? So you we talked a little bit or a lot about kind of acute training load and uh 
and the response to sessions and how we should kind of structure that. But how do you kind of use Omega Wave to to kind of monitor like chronic trading load over time, and how does that kind of look? Yeah, so um, once the athletes would get older, and we were testing on a almost daily basis, mm-hmm. the the training would change based on their readiness levels. Okay. So if we go back to the Monday, like the, you know, the very hard session. Yeah. Ideally, you know, they would do everything right over the weekend. They would yeah. get lots of sleep and they would come in Monday and they'd be ready to go. Uh-huh. But again, we don't live in a perfect world. Mm. And so we would test guys and, okay, their systems are down for yeah. whatever reason. Uh-huh. Okay. So we had what we were going to do in bucket a Mm -hmm. okay that's not going to happen today so now we're going to go to b and b may look like uh, and again depending on where they were on the test okay uh we're going to do 80 percent weights but we're not going to do anything to failure Mm. it's going to be you know instead of say 50 reps we're going to do 10 reps Mm -hmm. rest periods are going to be longer okay um, and it's, you know, they're still going to get a little bit of work in, yeah. but the intensity is not going to be there. Or we may go to bucket C, mm-hmm. which is kind of a bodybuilding circuit. Okay. Okay, Juan, man, you can train nothing over 60%. Mm-hmm. You can do biceps, triceps, some bench, you know, just get jacked today, mm. but but keep everything under that 60%, do what you want to do. Yeah. And just kind of, you know, enjoy it today. Mm, Okay. Or wanted really tired. Uh Okay. We're going to, okay. We're going to put you on the elliptical today for 40 minutes. Mm. Get your Walkman or not. not (laughs) I'm old, (laughs) Uh, you know, get your, get your headphones Uh and, you know, hop on there and keep your heart rate under 140 and, after that you're done Mm, okay so a a lot of different approaches here yep yep and um and then also based on the test we would say okay when you're home tonight yeah let's say they were more sympathetic dominant Uh uh-huh okay so so no contrast showers Uh uh-huh no ep no epsom salt baths because that would add to the stress response Mm, okay because they're already in it right now so then we would gear the recovery methodologies Mm -hmm. based on how their autonomic system was showing up on that day okay um and then um you know if it was a one-off yeah i then i would see how they came back the next day Uh if they were good to go but then if it became a pattern yeah where they just were not recovering Mm -hmm. okay now I'm going to dive into it more. So I'm going to start asking different questions of school. Okay. Yeah. You know, are you having issues with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Uh Um, you know, home problems. Are you sleeping? Okay. You're not sleeping. Okay. Are you waking up? Are you having a tough time getting out of bed? Yeah. So then you, you, you start to tease out some things, right? Yes, exactly. And so then from there, then you start kind of delving in and then we would take kind of one thing at a time to Uh see if that kind of got them back into the, um, you know, mode of, um, being ready to train. Mm, Okay. I like that. So just looking at different factors and and seeing what the, what the issue is really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I'll go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. So kind of with that, right. Um, what is the. I'm not super familiar with Omega Wave. So what kind of um, what kind of data are we looking at? Is it giving you, is it a dial? Is it like a dashboard? Or what necessarily are we looking at? And kind of how does that help us decide what to do next? Yeah, so it's giving us a dashboard for uh-huh. the cardiac system. Uh-huh. Um, it does give us um, energy supply systems. So you know, training heart rates for aerobic development, uh-huh. anaerobic development, cardiac development. Okay. And then, and then also the, the third part of it is the central nervous system. Mm. And so then based on those parameters, it's giving us an overall readiness. Okay. So for example, 
your cardiac system may be totally fine uh-huh. and it scales it on one to seven. Yeah. One, one being the worst seven being ideal. Okay. And so your cardiac system from a stress, from a functional reserves, mm-hmm. may be all sevens. Mm. Okay. But let's say your nervous system and ideal levels on that are like 15 millivolts up to 40. Okay. Let's say you're like zero. Yeah. And recommendation is no, um, um, you know, not a lot of sprinting or jumping. Uh huh. Okay. So now you even have, now you can even dive into the training more. So, for example, on say again, going back to the Monday, Mm -hmm. okay, let's do some, um, you know, uh, sprints. We're not going to do any sprints. We may touch on a little jumps, maybe a little med ball work. Mm -hmm. But say you're used to doing, um, for example, 30 throws, explosive throws in a session. Okay, today we're going to do two sets of four and we're done. Mm. Um, the weights, you know, we're going to keep them say between 65 to 75%. Okay. Um, you can still go hard, but we, we don't want to get up into that, you know, 85 to hundred percentile because your nervous system is just not ready to handle that type of weight today. Yeah. So you still get the training in based on what, one system is ready to uh-huh. do on that given day. Okay. I mean, you could even really do some, you know, some hard um, aerobic training if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, again, because your cardiac system is is ready to go. Mm. Okay. So it's again, it is just giving you that insight into how ready you are to train. Mm. Now, at the beginning. Some kids didn't believe it. They they would say, "Oh, I feel great." Yeah. So then I would use it as a teaching tool. So it's like, okay, well, you're not, but let's go out <laughs> and warm up. Yeah. Let's go out and and do the workout that we had planned. Yeah. And then halfway through the warm up, yeah, man, I'm just not feeling it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or halfway through the weights, they start struggling. Yeah. And again, you don't even need to say anything really. They understand, okay, I do not feel good today. Mm, yeah. So then you ask them, okay, put that in your memory bank, and then when you do feel good, compare it to how you felt today. Mm, yeah. Be- because uh, part of it, too, is when they go away to college, giving them these learning uh, tips to where they begin to understand um without some of the technology Mm -hmm. and a general level yeah how they're how they're feeling okay no i like that okay and then so diving a little bit more into kind of your thought process right so what are some resources that kind of had a big impact on you yeah so um elite fitness systems okay um when, when when dave tate started that yeah was a huge influence. I mean, Jim Wendler Uh at the beginning of my career was really, he really gave his time to me and spent time on the phone with me talking about training young kids and, and not getting stuck in the minutia of it. Uh Um, Louis Simmons, Uh um, like, man, I had every one of his articles copied. Oh, wow. Um, I read him, I reread him. Mm -hmm. We, we implemented stuff, um, and so, and then his recommendations on different books from Verkochansky mm-hmm. to some, um, some Polish coaches mm-hmm. on, you know, jumping and track and field movements. Yeah. Like it was, I mean, that at the beginning and the start, I mean, it really set me off in a great path. Mm, okay. um, and again, that's one of the reasons why I like doing this stuff, like yeah. this podcast with you is, mm-hmm. you know, people gave their time to me mm-hmm. at, at, you know, no cost really. Yeah. yeah. And so kind of giving back. Yeah. Uh, paying it forward. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and then I was fortunate to be around like, uh, Landon Evans. Yeah. Um, 
you know, Val Nasedkin, uh-huh. uh, Tom Myslinski, Buddy Morris. Wow, um, yeah. So, you know, like, you know, it was just a great time to come up. You know, the internet was just starting, so um, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, with that, right, so what kind of is on your current reading list and what kind of continuing education opportunities do you personally seek out? So my personal education right now, not so much on, I mean, my passion um, from on a personal level is on the endurance side. Uh-huh. And so, you know, I research a lot of what the Scandinavian countries do with regards to like biathlon and, um, you know, cross country skiing and, and, and cycling. Um, and a lot of the books that I read now are um, like the FBI and CIA, uh-huh. like, like how these how these huge government agencies and the people within them solve problems okay and how they and how they didn't solve problems and what were the mistakes that they made Uh because it comes down to being able to look at the problem Mm. and then how are we going to address it and i always undertook strength and conditioning as a history lesson okay because there's not a lot of new things out there yes and you know through history and what did some of the great coaches do in the past that they were so successful so why do we need to reinvent the wheel Mm. and that's a good point and then also um dealing with people okay how am i going to get Juan to buy into the program uh-huh. and, 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 and work to his full potential. Mm. Is it, um, you know, bringing you in as to part of the training process. Some kids wanted to be involved all the time. Yeah, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Others, they just wanted to come and train. Um, others, you know, they were just very inquisitive. So kind of understanding the motivation of the athlete. Yeah. And so then when I read, it's like, okay, how do I, how am I cognizant of being in the moment to understand what you need? Mm, okay. And it takes time to learn that. Yeah, I agree. And you, and you use your past experiences um, and failures, both, uh, you know, success and, and failures. Yeah. And, um, you know, you also have to be upfront with the kids that might have some, you know, extreme expectations. It's like, listen, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. You are not going to be college athlete, but you can try to get to your full potential, whatever that is. Yeah. And then that helps build the culture within the training Mm. facility to where everybody respects everybody's effort. Yeah. No, I like that. Okay. Awesome. And then kind of last question here, kind of to round this thing out, right? So what are some projects that you're currently working on and how can people kind of reach out to you and follow your journey? So like I said earlier, like a lot of my time is taken up now with, with Omega Wave. Mm-hmm. Um, but if people want to, you know, reach out to me, um, I can be reached at uh, Mark McLaughlin, okay. M-A-R-K-M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. Mm -hmm. Uh, the number five um, at gmail.com and um, you know if they have training questions you know um, something that I talked about today I found interesting I'm I'm more than happy to share um, documents that I have kind of outlining you know the training process and all that so Mm. okay as I said earlier there's there's no secrets out there so I'm (laughs) I share everything. Yeah, I love it. Awesome. Well, Coach, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Um, Thank you so much, and and hopefully we can connect again soon in the future. Yeah, thanks again, Juan. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye.